How many of you have heard Deb speak or you know Deb or most in this room? Are you kidding me? Uh, Deb uh, joined us for the first time last year, and she did me a favor by actually making the trip east. For those of you that know her, you know that she's from Portland. Um, she's a public sector communities manager for the Open Source Lab at Oregon State. I was recently at the lab in Oregon. I went out there in October, drove down there. You guys really did a great job. So again, she did me a favor by being here. She's fantastic. She's very well known in this industry. And uh, please enjoy uh, the talk by Deb Bryant. Deb, thank you again for being here. You're welcome. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you know, well, good thing I came up with some new material if you've heard me speak before. Uh, the talk today is, uh, I think we was promoted as talking about what, uh, how government is using open source. But I also want to, besides talking about some specific projects, I'm also going to talk about some trends and things that are changing and impacting uh, how government is, is using open source and also how it's affecting the industry. Because if you think about government, government has driven standards and the way technology has developed over the years just simply by the way it spends money or it consumes or it adopts software and it creates standards as it goes. So government has a big influence on the software industry. I'm going to take a minute to tell you about myself a little bit so you understand the context for some of my uh, comments and viewpoints because I get to do that sometimes because I'm not in front of the legislature. Uh, I worked for the state of Oregon for about five years. I was Oregon's deputy state CIO. So I learned a little bit about how government works, how it acquires technology. I had an opportunity to change some policies and think differently about the way we pr procured software. Uh, open source was just arriving on the scene as I was going. In 2005, a member of the House uh, introduced a bill to make it a law for all state agencies to use open source software first before they even considered or let a, uh, an RFP or request for proposal for proprietary software. And it was a difficult and awkward bill in uh, 2005, not well written, everyone agreed. So I was in the awkward and unusual position of testifying against a bill to make open source a law. But the state of Oregon was the first uh, state to actually introduce something like that. So we got to start the conversation. That was a lot of fun. Uh, today I work for Oregon State University's open source lab. And I'll tell you a little bit about that so you have that background too. I'm also responsible for uh, producing something called the Government Open Source Conference. We had it in DC the year before last, so that's that logo I could find. Uh, it's usually in Portland. We're going to be back in DC in August. Uh, I am on a number of boards. I'm an advisor or a board of director for the Open Source Digital Voting Foundation, Open Source for America, the Oregon Virtual School District, Democracy Lab, Code for America, Civic Commons, and their InterHealth International. And it's all pro bono, so I'm not a paid board member, but I did want to let you know that some of the uh, projects I'll be talking about I have a close affiliation with. <clears throat> I'm just a sucker for a civic cause where open source software is concerned. Oh, the light bulb is actually for my history before I worked for the state of Oregon. And I've located it strategically behind me because for a number of years, I was involved in startups. I was vice president and general manager of an internet company. Uh, so I got to watch uh, the internet industry grow up. We used a lot of software that uh, eventually became known as open source, but that's what we built our infrastructure, our commercial infrastructure on. So I was very familiar with that kind of software before I came on. The light bulb has not to do with bright ideas, but as a reminder that I no longer sit at my desk at one o'clock in the morning, making sure that when the VC comes by, they can see that the light is on and I'm still working for them. So the open source lab I mentioned is, uh, is where I work today. Uh, the OSL is a, is a unique uh, <laughs> data center in that it's, uh, it hosts a number of very large, high impact projects. The Linux Foundation's infrastructure, the Apache Foundation's infrastructure is homed in our data center. Uh, along with the uh, unusual hosting we do, we also have students, most of the students that do the work there. We have a dozen students or so during the, the year. We have five permanent full-time staff. Uh, and uh, we've become uh, a trusted neutral third party to host some important projects where there's not a commercial influence. They, they appreciate that. We also have uh, incredibly wonderful bandwidth and access to the internet and other things that make, make it a, a global class hosting center. And in 2005, uh, we put on the first government open source conference. We were taking what we learned from working with open source communities and then trying to uh, infer that into the, the government community. But this is an operational center, not an, an academic exercise. We're becoming more tied with the research side. Uh, 
today. Really quick overview, as I was trying to explain to a room of venture capitalists what the OSL has to do with commercialization, because we don't sell any commercial products, but we enable the open source community, so in turn, companies that are selling products that are based on open source can thrive. And that's, these are a few of the uh, uh, projects that we host there. I mentioned GOSCON. Uh, if you go to the website, there's a permanent archive of all the projects and talks. Most, most everything we've ever done is there, summer videos, all the, uh, the, the presentations. And we have kind of a cast of characters and, and stars. If you look, we have very early pioneers. In 2008, uh, our keynotes were Vivek uh, Kundra and Anish Chopra, who later became the following spring the CTO of the United States and the CIO of the United States. They're both working in the White House today. Uh, Vivek heads up the uh, Office of Management and Budget uh, for, the, for, for IT for the uh, federal government. And they now have an opportunity to influence policy and practice in the federal government. And there's some people here in the room that have actually sat and talked with them about those kinds of issues. So when I talk about open source today, I'm thinking about it in two ways. One is just the stuff you, that's already done that you can grab off the shelf, like Drupal as an example. And the other way, which I think is even more important and compelling for government, is how you use that uh, open source develop methodology to actually create what we call vertical applications, or applications that are specific to government. So if you think about state government, even though all 50 states have to do the same thing with Medicare, or reporting to the federal government, at the end of the day, that's still only 50 customers. That's a lot fewer customers than the available market for something like desktop software. So it becomes very soft, expensive software to write, and you, can only ha and you only have 50 customers, so it's extremely expensive. So this has been an area in the last few years the government is experimenting with to figure out how they can do that themselves along with uh, industry. And I'll, t I'll touch on a couple of specific projects so it makes more sense. Some of the trends I'm going to touch on, you'll see through some of the projects I talk about. The ecosystem is maturing, or we could say the marketplace is maturing. That is that the government is becoming more adept and thinking more about how to adopt open source. It's been used in infrastructure for years, down in the boiler room. Now that it's moving up into a more visible area, they're having more conversations about policy. Uh, there are more vendors today that are available to support government. Government needs to have support. And there are, if, they, if it's a, an enterprise that wants to have someone to call for a service contract, there are vendors now that specialize in supporting free software. Uh, there's also more curriculum available. Uh, we're starting to see some early workforce development. I'd like to see more of that. Community colleges actually offering courses in Linux and such. So every piece of that ecosystem, uh, including the way we uh, do policy and use uh, open source and operations helps move that forward. On an international basis, uh, governments are, are ahead of the U.S. in many respects in the way they're adopting open source. They have different drivers and rationales. Some countries are adopting it by policy. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the international uh, scene right now, but it, it's different in the, the U.S. has a, a much stronger base of commercial support and commercialization of open source and products. Uh, other countries are literally adopting it by policy. So as an example, the, uh, Malaysia has an open source competency center. And over 90% of their agencies use open source today. Sweden has a competency center. Um, Brazil has been using open source for over a decade. I mean, it's just the way they roll. They make their own software. They consider it part of their economic development strategy to be able to localize resources. Uh, the country of Spain also has a competency center. I just finished doing a study for them. They wanted to know how governments were using, uh, creating communities to, to create their own software. So this is um, an area that's been high interest in other countries. As I mentioned, the U.S. is ahead of commercialization. And here in the U.S., the last 18 months to two years have been interesting because a change in the federal administration and the, the, uh, the public conversation about open source has changed some of the ways that people think about open source. It's changed the ecosystem a little bit. And again, I'll talk about that through some specific examples. Uh, I want, so I'm going to start on the federal level. Now, there's two projects I want to touch on at the federal level because they have some interesting, they've made some interesting progress and they have some interesting challenges that also represent the same thing that other agencies will have to go through as they consider how they might open source some of the software they produce today. The Connect project, which I can touch on, David Riley and Vanessa Manchester are here in the audience with us. They were the lead 
uh, execs on that program uh, uh, for the first two years of the, the, the program. That particular project was unique in that they adopted every piece of the method and the model and the governance structure for a classic open source project as you could. They modeled it after the Apache project. They created a community. The Connect software, so this Connect software is essentially software that lets the, uh, the federal agencies exchange health information. And it became an important part of a greater strategy to be able to move health information around over networks. And then more broadly, if you could take that same software and offer it to hospitals, clinics, individual physicians, and it's free, then you'd have a pretty, pretty good capability and you could move that particular policy agenda forward to help exchange health information electronically. So they took the, did the strategy of making it an open source project. And companies that had a vested interest would show up with people do programs. They used uh, um, uh, something we've, we've called hackathons. We called it a, they called it a codathon because hack's not a really great word in the government parlance. And they started to build an, an ecosystem around them. They did all the kinds of things you do in terms of having wikis and newsletters and, uh, and forums and a way for people to produce that. But that involved the, a, a federal project. The US Veterans Affairs VISTA project which is a, a software that runs hospitals, essentially.